Good afternoon, I am Adrienne Ezell. I am an art director. I've been doing graphic design for 12 years now. I come from the gaming industry, but rather the traditional term of that. I've worked for casinos, your MGM and uh, Caesars Entertainment, doing a lot of short-term, oh my god, we need it yesterday stuff. So I fit right into board games, it turns out. Uh, so most recently, I've been the art director on Rambo the Board Game, which will be coming out later this year, the core game will and Secrets of the Lost Station, Leaders of Euphoria. So I've, I've been around, I've been doing stuff, and I've been also working with hobby gamers, or uh, like Kickstarter um, companies to get their stuff together, all their ducks in a row, and, and get stuff up. So that's what I do and why I'm here. All right, so first I wanna talk about the, I can't move around. First, I want to talk about the difference between graphic design and illustration. So there's probably a few people in the room that this means something to. Most of us, we have no idea. So that is the address of the Taj Mahal. Graphic design is to illustration like road signs are to attractions. So graphic design specifically is icons. Oh, I've moved too far on my slides, <laughs> and I can't quite see the screen. So your card frames, your layout, your die lines, the things that you need to get this information to your players, the things that at a glance is going to let them know how to use the elements of the game, how to go through the rule book and understand first, second, third, your order of operations. That's what graphic design is to a game. And illustration, as we all know, the wonderful pretty stuff. It's the, the, you know, the box, the character art on the cards. So these are two very different kinds of artists and very rarely, unless you're Ryan Lockett, do you have overlap? And he gets to design the games too, super jealous. <laughs> All right, so planning for art is the first thing I'm gonna talk about because the two most important things in working with an artist and getting your design into reality are planning and communication. So I'm going to go over when to start commissioning art, who you're hiring, where to find them, uh, quotes, how to get an accurate quote, how to be able to budget for your game do, using that information, um, how to negotiate price after you've received your quote, and project management, how to get the most beneficial outcome for all involved. So when to commission art. So we have crowdfunders and we have traditional publishers. So first I'm gonna talk about crowdfunding. You're looking for the minimum viable product if you are pre-campaign. And you need to start that about six months before, at the latest. And this is from working with so many Kickstarter creators that I know if I tell you a year before, which is where it's at for traditional publishers, heads explode. And I get that. And it's, a lot of, it's an outlay of money before you're ready to get things in order to get money in. So it's not really viable for a lot of Kickstarter creators. But at least six months before, you're gonna be looking at the minimum viable product. Now what that is, you have to have a box image this day and age. You just do. You need to have, if you're working on a story-driven or an immersive game, you need to have at least one character and that sort of thing. So you're looking at what is the minimum amount of stuff that I can show potential consumers that is gonna make, make them confident that I'm gonna produce a game that they wanna play. And so also your project page. I've seen a lot of people spend decent money on hiring artists and getting their Kickstarter project ready or their Indiegogo project ready and then do the project page themselves after they have that minimum viable product ready. And if you're not coming from a background where this is something you do every day, you're really doing yourself a disservice. So you, you've, you've put in the work, you have a good game, you've done all this other stuff, so don't overlook that project page. And you're gonna be looking at getting that started a month before your project goes live. It should be complete a week before your project goes live. It should be pre-approved by your crowdfunding a month to two weeks before your project goes live. It doesn't have to be complete, complete, when you get it approved, but you do need to go ahead and get your pre-approval. They're cracking down on that now. So just a little tidbit. <laughs> so traditional publishing. Generally these guys, like if they know it's an, if it's an expansion, if they know it's something that they're going to publish no matter what, they may start earlier than a year. But generally a year out, they're gonna start getting 
art together. Um, I say they because we had two people raise their hands when we asked who were publishers this morning, so <laughs> forgive me if I'm excluding you. Um, so they don't start until they have those printer quotes. They already know how much it's gonna cost to manufacture the game for this many units, this many units, this many units. And the reason they already, or they're ahead of the game when they have that is that's what you give to an artist to get a good quote. They need to know the box size. They need to know how many pages are in the rule book. They need to know how many cards. And then the age old question, in game design anyway, illustration first or graphic design first? This depends on the game. A lot of people are gonna tell you graphic design. And as a graphic designer, sure, yeah, throw me a check, I can make this happen. However, it depends on the game. If your game is story driven, if your game is highly immersive, if your game live or, lives or dies by the art, and by art, in this case, I mean illustration, that has to come first. But there are ways to get around saying, oh, well, now this is a landscape image and I need a vertical image. That's generally the reason people are gonna tell you graphic design comes first. Um, and I'll get in that, into that a little bit more in a few slides, but graphic design would come first if you have a game that is highly dependent on being able to recognize a lot of information at a glance. If you have five different things you need to put on one card, you have to have your graphic design first. There's a decent chance you don't actually have room for an image, which saves you money in the long run because you're not buying individual illustrations. Whereas if you do illustration first, you're out X number of dollars per illustration, and now you're like, well, the card text is too small and nobody can read it. And that's an unfortunate, that is very common, <laughs> is to have art you can no longer use. So where to find artists? So this, we're still in the planning stages here. I've had a lot of luck with ArtStation. ArtStation is the deviant art of five years ago, but these people all want jobs. Now, deviant art artists, some do as well, but it's a portfolio site. It's a, hey, look at this awesome stuff I can do. I wanna be part of this community and talk about these new Photoshop filters and these new things I can do. ArtStation is that same level of passion, but they want to be hired. And then one of the things I definitely wanna share with you is in the top uh, right there, you see the, the little search box. That little blue check mark is ArtStation Pro. So like many platforms out there, you can pay to be a sponsored member of ArtStation. Now, if you are a new publishing company, self-publishing company, and you're looking to save money, uncheck that box. You're gonna find virtually the same caliber of art, but people that haven't been doing it long enough, haven't been established enough to have um, the money to pay to be sponsored. So you're going to get people that are slightly more willing to work with you and definitely have more open schedules. Um, also social media. There's a, a couple decent Facebook groups. Uh, you can approach me after and we can go over specific ones where you can say, hey, I have a game that's this theme or this, this art style. I definitely want painterly this or I want you know, very Japanese flavored this. Um, and you'll get responses, and people are linking their portfolios so that you can find, find artists on social media, the same thing with Twitter. And then don't overlook your professional contacts. Like, it's a, this is a small community. We see each other at all these cons. Hey, who did your whatever, whatever game? You know, they're, they're not gonna be shy about passing on um, artist names, and then you also get that personal referral of they were easy to work with, they responded immediately, they beat my deadlines, you know, so. All right, so getting quotes, like I referenced before, if you already have your quote from your, quote from your printer, you're ahead of the game because that's gonna give you the information you need to relay to an artist with just a few additions that is gonna get you an accurate quote. So spreadsheets with line items. So if you've done stuff with balancing math, you probably already have tons of spreadsheets for your game. Well, you also need a spreadsheet for what's actually in your game. Every token, every component, every card, you can't really guess how many pages are gonna be in your rule book until you're done with your rule book. You probably don't have it done at this point, but leave it out. You can do things in chunks and that's gonna make it easier for you, easier to get through the project and definitely easier for your artist. And my last tip for this is plan for overrun. When you give them the whole scope of the project and you get that bottom dollar amount, you need to make sure you ask for a line item, first of all, for everything you have in your quote that you're asking for. 
And then you also want to ask them, if I need to add four cards, I mean, hey, it's playtesting. If I need to delete 10 cards, if I need to add four cards, how are we gonna work that out in pricing? So that you get a piecemeal pricing for individual pieces. Don't expect that to be the price if you then turn around and say, I only wanna buy five cards for my Kickstarter. That won't be how the artist works, but you'll know for budgeting and you'll know as you're making changes during your playtest, hey, if I add a sixth player, that's another player board, five tokens, four cards, you already know, okay, that's adding X number of dollars to my art budget. And same thing with your printer, it's adding X number of dollars to my unit cost. So this is an example of the high level summary, which you'd be familiar with from getting from, or giving to or getting back from your printer. This is what I'm talking about, just adding a few things to, to be able to get that accurate quote from your, from your artist. So to make this ready to email to an artist and ask for your quote, you need to sort the cards by common back, which will be the way they print. Um, your printer probably has already done this for you. So if you have item cards, character cards, you know, uh, anything else you would add, you know, artifacts, something else, those are probably gonna have three different backs, but the frame around them is gonna be the same. So for your artist, that's three pieces of work, three card backs pieces of work, which may or may not be changing a color, or changing a symbol, and then the iterations thereof. So if you need 40, of a single kind of card, letting the artist know that, you're gonna get a better quote than you say, I need 247 cards. One, it'll be accurate, you won't get a bill afterwards going, hey, you're not actually paying me to do this, so I'm not gonna do it till you pay me. Or, you're not gonna be, so you're not gonna be surprised at the end, and your artist isn't gonna be surprised. So then also break down sizes down to the unique type, which is basically the sort by common back. So here's an example of what this looks like spread out, and this is also my example of minimum viable product. I'm actually in the end stages of this specific job right now. We're getting it ready to go to print. And from this, I've wound up with six, 368 iterations of cards, and you notice there's, there's no numbers on here that big. This was what the publisher decided they needed to show consumers on Kickstarter to be able to launch their Kickstarter page and it worked, and they overfunded, and it was great. And so you'll see that I have things broken down. The, my notes are the ones on the right, the one retail box design, two expansion box designs. Those are all things that I added as I was giving them the quote when I clarified with them what it was they wanted so that I could get them a, an extremely accurate quote. So, and this, uh, you'll also see these things here under art provided that says yes. Those are things they already had the illustrations for because those were the things to the publisher that were the most important. So I already had art to work with, and I already knew how important it needed to be on the card, which informed my design for the card frame for it, for how much of it I needed to show. So as much information as you can give your artist as possible is gonna lead to the most accurate quote possible. So negotiation, once you have that back, so what I actually did there was there's another, there was another column to the left, which was my pricing. So every single one of those line items had my price over here to the left. You can actually still see the little, the lines where I didn't quite crop it close enough over to the right. Um, so that box covers, I actually broke down per five, like by five. And then rule book, they just wanted the cover, which was a re-implementation re of, of the box cover art and that sort of thing. So that was much cheaper than say, making a completely custom die line. And having it broken out this way, you can look at the pricing and if you know, for your game, something like, I just want you to put the word rule book on top of the box art. I don't wanna pay $200 for that. You know, and you're, cause you're seeing it broken out instead of just seeing one lump sum price. All right, so negotiation. Really to negotiate with an artist, because art is a commodity, art is a lot like, so you're, ha you're having a wedding, you ordered a wedding cake, Flour and butter and sugar cost money. If you don't get married, the baker still gets paid. That's art for a board game. If you have a proof, even a single proof, not a sketch, but a proof of art that you have commissioned, you are obligated to pay for that art whether or not you use it or cancel the game completely or whatever happens. So that's when you have that total pricing and you have the piecemeal pricing, that's when you can come in and negotiate and say, well, 
my card backs are all going to be the logo of the game. It's not something we really do anymore, but just for ease of explanation, it's going to be the logo of the game, but the items are going to have red background, and the characters are going to have green background. They're not going to charge you full design price for those. So that lets you go in and say, really, I need one card back, and can you output the PDF with uh, four different colors? And that's going to save you money. So when you get into that nitty gritty, it's going to let you decide where you want to spend money and possibly things you want to leave off if, if you can't negotiate down. So that a la carte pricing I was talking about for overruns, that's going to benefit you in the long run, like I said, for planning, for what I want to add, what I want to take away, kind of how you can come back with that artist and say, well, since your card frame designs are $75, I really want to use these two the same and change a color or change an icon. Can we deduct that $75 from that quote? And when you're talking about something like that minimum viable product, that, you know, that may be a fifth of what you're paying total to get your stuff done for, for Kickstarter. For graphic design, these are my graphic design quotes, not my illustration stuff, because I don't illustrate. I used to be able to draw by hand, but the computer killed that. All right, so you're paying for quality. I mean, some of my favorite artists or you know, Quan Chai, Beth Sobel, Jackie Davis, I can't afford them. It's part of the reason I sell games to publishers, <laughs> or I, li I, I uh, license games to publishers, it's because they can. Um, but you're paying for quality, you're paying for the name, you're paying for the recognition. So realize that when you're requesting quotes. If you're just absolutely in love with an artist, the most visible part of your game is the box. If you can pay an artist that you can't afford to have do your whole game, but you can pay them to do the box cover, and that's gonna give you the shelf presence that you want for the game, then there you go. You've worked around that. So don't be scared to break up your art project between different artists. Because for a lot of things, especially graphic design-wise, you can go with a production artist. This is somebody that, whose name's probably never on a box. I'm generally not, unless I'm doing the art direction. Um, but they're doing the day-to-day, -day, get it done, I need, a, there's a reason a lot of cards look like magic cards. It's because it works. You know where everything is. You've got your icons in the right places. Like there's not a lot of innovation to be done on a card, that kind of specific card, if that makes sense. So there's no reason to pay, you know, the Mercedes when you can, <laughs> instead of the Toyota. Does that make sense? Uh, car, car metaphors I probably shouldn't have gone into. But so splitting up the work is another way to save money and, and still get you still meet your expectations of your game. So one of the most important things, and this is the, another thing I alluded to in the beginning, is create chunks of work. This is gonna save you so much time, so much anxiety throughout your game project. So whether you're traditional publishing or your Kickstarter publishing, that minimum viable product is still important for things like marketing. Do the most important stuff first. Do the stuff you know that's not gonna change first. Like graphic design for your rulebook is never the first thing you should do. Your rulebook should stay in Microsoft Word or Google Docs until it has been edited a minimum of 12 times, <laughs> until you think you're really, really done um, because you're paying your artist to change that now once you have that set up. So it's gonna help you with deadline adherence if you need four types of cards done, but you don't want to see all 40 of those item cards we talked about. You just want to see one, and make sure, you, make sure it's got the information, make sure it's easy to read. Then you, you, you get one, you pay them for one, and that's how you're breaking that up. So you may get all your cards done at one time, your box done at one, uh, a separate time, your tokens done at a separate time, your die lines done at the very end when you actually need to send it to print, because Kickstarter backers don't need to see your entire punch board with the, you know, the lovely pink lines for cutting it out, that doesn't mean anything to most people. So it's gonna help you break out payments as well, which is especially important if you are kickstarting or you're crowdfunding so that you can kind of stagger out uh, the way you're paying. It's also gonna keep your artist happy because instead of paying them once in March and then their last payment in March of the next year, they're gonna be a lot happier if you're paying them incrementally in the middle, but you're paying for work, not just separating out payments. And that's also gonna help you keep, keep uh, the project moving. So you're always moving forward and you always have something else to do. Um, so as you can tell, I am, I'm a big 
big proponent of diversity, and so this is kind of the break between my design and communication parts, parts of the presentation, and I was going to ask um, for everyone to name, or for a few people to stand up and name scientists, inventors, um, influential people of the last, you know, 100 years. But because we're streaming, and I don't want everybody to have to come up to the mic, when I've done this previously, I get, you know, Newton, I get um, Neil Armstrong, I get Einstein. And so that is why diversity and representation is important, is because what first comes to mind is what we've been told. It's what we've seen in high school. It's what the specials on TV are about, you know, the, the museum exhibits. So I apply this to art. I apply this to hiring artists that are informed on what I'm doing, especially if I'm doing a, a themed game that is from a certain region, I'm going to actively look for an artist from that region um, or that has experience in what I'm doing. So that's, this guy invented birth control. He's like my hero, seriously. No one knows his, no one knows his name. Top left, uh, Nobel Prize winner from last year. First black woman in space that happened in 2007. The, this is why representation is important. So communication. The key to seamless workflow, deadline adherence, and producing to expectations is absolutely communication. You can pretty much never communicate enough with your artists. So the way I've broken this down is questions you need to ask your artist up front, how to clarify directives with them and what you need to clarify to make sure you both understand, don't take anything for granted. Um, stopping unsatisfactory work, how do you do it, even if you feel bad about it? <laughs> Giving feedback, how do they wanna get it, how do you wanna give it? And checking in with them, when are you bothering them or when are you, you know, just moving stuff along? So questions you wanna ask your artists. I have actually recently quit my full-time job in casino stuff to do this full time, to do art for hobby board gaming full time. Previously, I was working on things from seven at night, because I had a crap commute, <laughs> until like two in the morning. There's very few publishers I can pick up the phone and call them at 1 a.m. Central Time and actually get an answer. So knowing when they work, and that's certainly no judgment on the level of art they do. I, I, I built up enough client base from working until two and three in the morning to be able to quit my job and do it full time. So I'm certainly not saying you don't want to hire those people, but you just need to know. You need to know when are they going to be available for phone calls, when are they going to answer your emails, when are they going to do the bulk of the work, which is important if you need to stop them. Maybe a play test went incredibly amazingly and you're deleting an entire kind of card from the game. Stopping them before they do it means you don't owe them money for it. <laughs> so payment, how do they want to get paid? When do they want to get paid? How often do they want to get paid? Making assumptions here is how people lose artists. I mean, I, I feel like we've all kind of heard people kind of grousing about deadlines not being met or you know, somebody not performing up to the expectation or it's been four days and they haven't got a return on an email that was a really important email. And part of that is clarifying all of these things. You're, you're gonna get a better response if you both no, maybe they think it's complete, or maybe for them it is completely normal to it be seven days before they get back to you. And that's just how they work, but you didn't know that on the front end. So extra work, how are they gonna handle it? Can they handle it? Do they have the time to do it? And do they need to be paid immediately if you add four cards? Is it something you can settle up at the end, going back to payment? Just always talking through it. You, you can't be too plain and you're the boss. When you're commissioning art, they may know all about pixels, they may know all about these programs that you've never opened, but you are their employer. You have the right to know all of this and you have the right to clarify all of this and not feel like you're, now you just have this big bill and what you get is what you get. Not how it works, <laughs> shouldn't be how it works. And so feedback, how do they want feedback? When do they want it? Do they want you to hold everything to the end? Say you gave them one of your chunks, you split out all of your cards. The minute they send you a proof, is it okay if you type back like, oh gosh, this was blah, 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 wrong, wrong place, I need you to change this to this? Or do they want you to wait till you've gotten all of it together? Interrupting workflow, especially for artists that have a set 
way they do things can kind of put a, a, a hitch in things and make things go slower. So some people want to go ahead and change it right now and be done. Pardon me. And some people want to wait till the end, make all of the changes, and now your deliverable is completely ready. So clarifying directives. The biggest is providing art direction. And in fact, every single thing I've talked about today in my like four more slides is what an art director does. So if you cannot hire an art director, you need to be your art director. So you need to have an art direction document that is, these are the fonts that convey this theme. These are the colors that convey this theme. This is the tone we are going for. Is it a family game? Is there things we're always going to avoid or the things we want to do? Is it, you know, culty? Is it Cthulhu? Do we want dark? These are things you have to let them know, illustration or graphic design, from the beginning. So it, you are responsible for providing that. You don't just say, hey, I, I, you can. It just is going to go poorly. I want five cards of these types. Oh, yeah, it's a Cthulhu game. I've been asked to provide quotes on games where they didn't tell me the name of the game didn't tell me what the game was about. I can do that. I don't want my name on it when it comes out because I have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> so specify the programs. This is going to be informed by your printer. Generally, printers are going to print from PDFs. If you have a printer that wants to print from JPEGs, do not hire them. That is very bad. Um, so generally, for rule books, for text-heavy cards, or generally cards, you're going to want InDesign. You're going to want to tell them they need to have InDesign files. They need to provide you with InDesign files. Say your artist gets married, goes away on honeymoon, decides to you know, move to Greece and stay there because it was just so nice. You need to be able to get that InDesign file and go to another artist who can then pick up where they left off and make things happen. And always remember that you own the files. All work today is, is, is contract work. You need to specify that at the beginning. You own the rights, and you own the files to everything they create that you are paying them to create. So you can absolutely specify the programs. Uh, if you have an artist that only works in Photoshop, that's not your rulebook artist. That's not your card frame artist. That's not your icon artist. Those things need to be vector. So you get to specify all of that. Issue deadlines. Make another spreadsheet. Mark when they've finished it. Let them have access to it as well so they can give you updates. Maybe they're waiting on something from you and you didn't know it. Maybe they're not as good as communication as you're going to be now. And they think they need the illustrations or something that you're like, no, I'm not getting those done yet. Uh, I need the frames. You, you may be sitting and waiting, and you're both waiting on each other, and you don't know it. That's really common. <laughs> that actually still happens to me all the time. So I've made a point where if I haven't heard from my publishers in about 24 to 36 hours, I ping them and say, waiting on blah, blah, blah for the stuff <laughs> so that I can get their, get their things to them. Um, and then specify changes. This is going to be something that's in your contract and it's something that needs to be discussed up front. My common or my standard is three changes to a thing which is another reason to get like just your item card done, not all 40, is you get three changes included with my design, included with my box design, included with my rule book design, which is another reason you need your rules edited. Because <laughs> that counts for changing, oh, we decided monster is now going to be ancient evil. That's easy for me to go do, but I have to go open up your file and do it again and export it again and make sure it's printer ready again. So that's 30 minutes of my time for a change that, yeah, the computer can do, but I have to make sure it works. So you need to know exactly how many things you're already paying for. So this, one's, this one is touchy. So if you don't like the work, what do you do? The first thing is, again, you are the boss. You, you need to have them stop work. You can be as nice or as blunt as you want to be, but this is a business. You know, it, everybody's, <laughs> everybody's kid brother is a graphic designer. You could have gotten free work if you wanted free work, but you're paying for work. So if you get something that is completely not to your expectations, you need to have them stop immediately and just basically tell them that. This isn't what I expected. Hold off on everything else. Hold off on this. 
and I'm gonna get back with you. And then take time to reflect and see what can be done about it. Is it possible that with changes you can get what you asked for originally? Is it possible that your directives didn't actually get to them? Did they not see the art direction document? Did they not see the images you kind of wanted it to look like? Other games you wanted it to look like? If you don't think you can get it changed to what you want within your free changes, free, within your included changes, you need to terminate the contract with that artist and move on to a different artist. And unfortunately, that means you do need, do need to pay them for that piece that they did, but that's kind of a learning curve and now you know for that specific artist, not learning her for you know, the process in general. So constructive feedback. You need to invest to get what you want. And in this case, I'm talking about time. So you need to show examples. Art direction documents are generally collections of Google images. It's you giving brief, brief statements about what you want. This should remind us of Blade Runner or we want this to be Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles but not get sued. You know, it, it's literally sentences like that. Pulling images, Google search images, and saying, like, I want, for instance, this was, this was a thing I did for Rambo. I want this lady's hair because it's amazing and wouldn't get caught in crap in the jungle. In this stance, with these guns, I'm fairly certain I'm on all kinds of lists now from looking up different grenades and weapons, and I can talk forever about Vietnam era weapons, y'all. Um, but that's what I did. I pulled grenade belts, I pulled textures of leather, and it's a piecemeal over there. It's like, this is the kind of leather I want it to look like, or this is that green tactile, or, uh, tactical vest bit, you know, I want them to be wearing, and I know they didn't have body armor, but I'm not gonna show the boobs on the lady. <laughs> So she's gonna be wearing this, you know, and, and dealing with that. That's the kind of stuff you're providing. So if they didn't do that, that's when you're coming back and maybe giving more explanatory photos of other people doing things. Like I use Laura Croft stuff a lot because she does some pretty cool action poses. And I'm like, you know, this, this pose, but with clothes on. Um, <laughs> uh, so order of operations is also very, very important. If the most important thing to you is your box, and for a lot of people it is, because that's to me what makes the game real, I get really excited about buying art, um, tell them that. If you do have changes to some of the chunks of work you did, but you need to move on and get something else ready because you need to show it to the printer or you need to get more stuff up on a Kickstarter update, let them know so they're not doing it in an order you're not expecting putting you behind for what you need to do for your business practices. And then paid versus included. When you give them the feedback, let's say we go back to that instance of, this is not what I asked for at all. If you provided a good art direction document and you get, say, a character back from an illustrator, that's not what you asked for at all. You shouldn't have to pay to change it to get it to what you want, what you asked for originally if you have an art direction document that says, this hair, this body, these clothes, and all they did was the pose and then did what they wanted, that's not following your direction and that's not the verbal agreement you had with them or the contract agreement that you had with them. Um, however, when it's things like, I want her hair a little bit longer, I want this weapon slung over her shoulder, not so combative where she's pointing it at the, you know, at the fourth wall kind of thing, that stuff that should be included. If you're over your change limit, you need to start inquiring about if we make these four or five other tweaks, what's the cost on that? Now one of the things I do, and I know a lot of artists do, is if somebody tells me, this icon needs to move to the left, I want the text to be bold, and I need the title of the card right justified. That's not three changes, that's one change. Because they told me that at one time, I go in and do it and I send them the, the proof back. So that's another thing to consider, is don't bombard with one change, one change, one change, when you know there's something a little off. Take your time, wait a day, till you have all of your thoughts in order about what you think about that piece of art, and then give them all the changes at once, because that's gonna be the most cost-effective thing for you to do. So, like I said, art is a commodity. You have to pay for what you get. So good art costs money. Um, be prepared to pay, negotiate, have your needs organized and manage your budget. And don't accept bad art. 
Nobody makes a game just because, like, hey, I want to make money. Not in this day and age. There's too many games out there. You're making it because you have a passion for it. You're making it because this is what you want to do. If it's not what you want, change it. Make sure you get what you ask for. Um, so a few tips and tricks. I think I have, do I have a few minutes? I do have a few minutes. So one of the things I like to do to help Kickstarter or crowdfunders save money is kind of go with the traditional box, which is your three or four main characters on the front, and make sure they ask the illustrator to do layered art, that you want each character on a different layer. What that's going to allow you to do with a little bit, or a graphic designer like me, because I, I can't paint in Photoshop. It's amazing, and I wish I could but I can sure as heck pull that layer out and put it on one of your cards, and now your minimum viable product went to all I had to do was buy a box cover initially because I can make you four character cards from that. If they're holding weapons that are also on another layer, boom, I've got an item card because I can pull that out. So a lot of it is that planning, knowing who, you need to know what you need. And there are ways that are, like that, that's not insulting to the artist, that's not bad. They got paid to do the cover. You've just asked them to place things on different layers so that you can reutilize that art. So now you've invested in something, and maybe you can pay a little bit more for that cover and get what you really, really want, and be able to use it for you know 10 different things, and you're ready for your product to be shown on Kickstarter. Um, you'll still need the Kickstarter graphics, you know, the headers and the, the GIFs and all that stuff. But so, do we have any questions about maybe how to make things less expensive or or more affordable? Sure. So up until a few minutes ago, I didn't know the difference between a graphic designer and an illustrator. Thank you. So very new, but this part of it. Um, but the question I have for you is you, you explained the difference between graphic designer and illustrator, but kept using the word artist, artist, artist. And then the spreadsheets that you had had components and things like that in there. Mm -hmm. So can you help kind of maybe clarify artist relative to what you had said about the game? Or I'm sorry, the graphic designer and the illustrator and that artist's interaction maybe with physical components outside of what I thought I was thinking of, which was just mm -hmm. the art. Okay, so um, graphic design, like I said, is gonna be things like your icons and your dye lines and things. Now, if you have, if you want to continue the same style of your character, say you do painterly stuff, that's really, really common right now, and you don't want a crisp icon, like think, think of, you know, like a combat symbol in most games. That's gonna be a really crisp, usually like black on white thing. That's graphic design. If you want it to be an awesome painted explosion, that's an illustrator. And you're gonna commission, you know, a tiny little <laughs> explosion from your illustrator or crop it out of your cover. Um, <laughs> so when I'm using artists interchangeably here because these same things work for both illustrators and graphic designers, say you were putting out a magic expansion and ordering all of, they don't do this, they, they spread their art out, but, and you were ordering all of the illustrations on those cards from the same illustrator, I guarantee you those are gonna be less each because you ordered 100 than if you ordered two. So it's that same kind of, same kind of pricing. Does that clarify? Oh, right. Oh, right, right, right. So I think some of those had things like the standees and things, which I was just showing the document that you're, you would give your printer to figure out the pricing. So no, like I, I don't deal with um, the plastic bits or the, the things that don't have art on them. No, I don't, I don't have to deal with. But as far as, like say they said they needed seven tokens that are for seven different things, not seven of one thing, I know I need to do the layout, pick, you know, do the size, do the shape, and then possibly an icon for all of those. Mm -hmm. Hi. <clears throat> so I'm not a graphic designer, but I play one in my spare time. Nice. I'm working on prototypes and such. And um, I use a lot of stock art. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered, um, you know, working with artists, working with other, I mean, what, where does stock art fit in, in kind of what you would say the, the overall workflow is and the deliveries are? Um, you know, would you use stock art directly? Would you expect artists to 
use stock art perhaps to fulfill something, maybe tweaking it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. A lot of those are very layered, so you can take them apart. Yeah. So I'm just kind of curious your experience and how should, how should we think about that? Yeah, so if you're using stock art unchanged, it's not something I generally recommend for um, going to a published game because your contract or your license for that art is generally 500,000 impressions. Yeah. And especially if you're using it multiple times in the game, you can actually get up to that pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, now, as far as changing it, that's something that everybody winds up doing. Yeah. Um, so putting stuff like, say, buying an explosion, putting it in the background, and then putting your cool stuff on top of it, perfectly acceptable to do. I wouldn't use yeah. anything whole hog. Um, sure. then now, there are icon packs that maybe you want to use an icon from. I would make changes to them so that yeah. you could make it unique to you and, and keep using it. They're, they're kind of different classifications, I would exactly. say. Stalker, like there's, there are icons, like gameicons.net yeah. and, and uh, you know, uh, noun.com, et cetera. There yeah. are lots of sort of vector icon types mm -hmm. of things. But then there are actually like illustrations. I, I do everything exclusively in vector. Me too. Um, but you can, yeah, awesome. But you can do all of that. I mean, you can get all kinds of cool stuff in, yeah. in vector art. In fact, a lot of stuff I've used is, seems to be from the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just curious, you know, I, I don't know. It, would you ever see those actually used? Or yeah, so I, I pull out pieces and um, I'll use different bits, especially like if you're talking about slot machines and stuff, yeah, yeah. like I'll change the reels, I'll change what's on them, um, zoom, crop in different, different parts. Um, but you, that's definitely something you can do. You need to hold on to your licenses and make sure you print them out. Um, like I know iStock, you have to actually go in and download it, and yeah. then it just gives you a list of the numbers that all apply to that thing. Um, just make sure you keep everything together and you're not claim like you wouldn't claim illustration on it you would claim graphic design on does that make sense yeah 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 understood. so attribution yeah yeah okay Thanks. thank you so what do you what do you wish your clients understood about your craft can you come up with like an example where you like had a misunderstanding because they didn't really understand what your job was oh yeah for sure i get asked to edit rules all the time and yeah you got to pay for that um, i'm i'm here to put them in boxes and make them look pretty so, and it, it actually is a service I offer and I wind up getting in kind of, I really like games. Um, so I wind up doing more than I should do, but there are definitely times when they don't understand the time. Um, you can do a lot of stuff with Excel and InDesign to automate card population, but you still have to go in and edit the spreadsheet in nearly every single cell every time you do that, and then they'll make changes to it and they don't realize you had to make your own special spreadsheet. So what is an easy change for them may take me two and a half hours. So definitely, um, I, I think the biggest thing is understanding the time that stuff does take to do. Just because it's easy for me, because it's what I do every day, it doesn't mean it doesn't take time. Uh, if my graphic design is 90% of the way done, because I, I've done a lot of playtesting, it's pretty, pretty mm -hmm. uh, nailed down, but I might uh, adjust things a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is it too early to hire an illustrator to make the actual art that goes? In the boxes? Yeah. No, um, not at all. If you, if you know you're going to have space for it, yeah. if, you're, if you know you're going to need to include it, then no, it's not. It's, it's perf you know, perfectly reasonable to go ahead and approach somebody about doing, doing the illustrations. Cool. And I have a second quick one. If I'm doing something, uh, I've never hired an illustrator before, should I hire someone who does, my game's about food, should I hire someone who has uh, examples of food or should I hire someone who has the best skill and hope that they can do food? Um, hire somebody that whose work you like and be completely upfront and honest with them. Um, I've had artists that I wanted to work with that hadn't done the style I had done or needed and asked and they uh, wanted to do it so they sent me a quick sketch and I mean in like 30 minutes and they were in Spain and I was super impressed um, and they got the job but it's more of you're looking for the final product so if, if the style is more important or more important than technical correctness, like, I mean, we can tell it's a strawberry, but it's not the most strawberry looking strawberry ever. So you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like if matching the style is more important than that, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think I am done. And if you guys would like to hit me up later, I was originally gonna talk about pricing, but especially being online, I don't want to, uh, Kind of, I, I don't want a bunch of people mad at me. No throwing tomatoes. So um, if you would like to catch me afterwards, we can talk about more stuff. I love art and I love games. Thank you so much.